<laughs> Hope everyone's having a nice evening. My name is Judy Gilmore and I'd like to welcome you all to our third artist lecture of the semester. And tonight we have a really special guest, the artist and curator, Yura Adams. Um, before I get into Yura's background, um, I wanna introduce myself. My name is Judy Gilmore and I'm the director of Opauka Gallery. Um, we are so very excited to have a wonderful show in the gallery right now um, entitled Unraveling, curated by the very um, Yura Adams who will be speaking tonight. Um, Unraveling is a wonderful show of four artists, um, Yura Adams uh, the, uh, as the artist and curator, um, Ruby Palmer, Joan Grubin, and Christina Tanaglia. And each of these four artists presented one of <clears throat> something very large and site specific in the gallery. And so it's really a must see in person show. Um, with that said, because of the circumstances in the world today, we understand that might not be possible, but we do, we do encourage you to come. It is safe to come to the gallery. We are open Tuesdays through Saturdays, 12 to five, as well as Thursdays, 12 to eight. Um, we will be open until December 19th. The show will be open and we have several Several safety precautions in place, including a mask requirement, a um, medical form, temperature check, and of course, um, keeping social distance while in the gallery. And we are now no longer allowing any more than 10 people in the gallery at any time, though most times we have many fewer guests. Um, so it really is a safe space. But if you cannot um, come see the show, please um, view the exhibition website, which just went live. You can find that from our website, which is opalka.sage.edu. There you can take a virtual tour of the exhibition as well as see the work from the artists both in um, in the gallery as well as um, shots from their studios. So there's many ways you can experience the exhibition and I sure encourage you to do so. If you are on campus and you are a SAGE student, um, drop by please. We, would wel we welcome you. We're hoping to have a student reception sometime before the Thanksgiving break. So please be on the lookout for that because we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to come to ask questions. We always serve food, something fun, but this is your gallery and we want you to take advantage of it. So please do come by. With that said, I also want to encourage you all to um, attend the one other artist talk we have this semester with artist Christina Tanaglia. Christina is also in the show and she will be talking on December 3rd. So please mark your calendar for that talk as well. Um, I want to thank Yura for her wonderful curation of the show. This is the first unsolicited curatorial proposal that we've ever accepted at Opauka. It goes a long way in saying that we had great, um, a, a wonderful reaction to Yura's idea and we could not be happier with how it turned out. Um, so we're really excited to have Yura's vision um, in the gallery as we speak. I'm going to introduce Yura by reading her biography. Um, Yura Adams recently received a Pollock Krasner grant and she exhibited at the Hyde Collection in Glens Falls, New York. She's exhibited at Collar Works in Troy and she has produced and she recently produced a large scale handmade paper installation for her one person show at the Courthouse Gallery in Lake George, New York. She has been presented as a visual and performance artist in numerous venues in California and New York. And she has had many one person shows at the John Davis Gallery in Hudson, New York. Yura is the Curator and Director of Contemporary Art at the Foundation Gallery at Columbia Green Community College in Hudson, New York. And you can find Yura's work online at yuraadams.com. So Yura, Yura, welcome. And we can't wait to hear what you have to say tonight. Thank you, Judy. Hello to everybody. It's so great to see your faces out there. I'm really grateful for you coming out and spending some time with me tonight. I. Uh, I'm going to make this a linear presentation and I am going to share a screen right now and I'll start there. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, what hangs above my studio door and it's a flying corn cob because I am from Iowa. I am uh, the second youngest in a family of six. I was very lucky to have a mother that fostered creativity in all of us and she was deeply invested in that development, gave me a lot of confidence in that regard. And in that insular kind of nest of the family, I was able to make images, which I started early on, and also installations with my older sister. We would make stuff all over the house and she would leave it up. I remember it was up for at least a month one time. And it was in a family of eight people. 
uh, Iowa was isolated. I didn't really know what was outside of Iowa, but I knew there was something out there from reading magazines and watching television. So I actually left at age 17, came back a few short periods and left for good when I was 19 years old and went out to the Bay Area and enrolled in the San Francisco Art Institute. And that brings me to my first slide. Here we go. Uh, uh, when I got out there, I was kind of surprised because they asked me uh, what department I wanted to be in. And I hadn't considered that before. I was quite naive about what art was and I didn't know what to say. So I said painting. And that turned out to be a pretty good choice. Um, starting in painting allowed me to work out a lot of impulses and get familiar with the studio, what one does in the studio and to fall in love with making imagery. Uh, this painting was made while I was a painting major at the San Francisco Art Institute. Towards the end of my painting degree, I fell in with a group of photographers and uh, Joel Sackett and Dennis Hearn taught me how to handle a camera and work in the dark room. I never captured, that's the word we use in digital photography. I never photographed encountered images. I constructed sets to photograph. This activity felt very natural to me as a painter. And at that point I moved over in my practice to photography and made these elaborate sets using a 35 millimeter and printing in black and white. Uh, here's another one. Uh, they were titled really simple, like the one before was piano and this was shell. Uh, in San Francisco, the south of market scene was exploding with activity when I was there. It was a pretty interesting time to be out there. And uh, my friend Tony Labatt approached me and he said, look, I'm organizing a performance uh, series and you want to do a performance? And I guess I felt like taking risks. And so I said, yes, and, but I wasn't so brave as to make my per first performance, not this one pictured here, but I made a giant fish head that I hid behind. And I gave a lecture on ichthyology in which I had purchased a bunch of fish from the a market in Chinatown and dressed them up and painted on them and made up stories about what kind of fish they were. That was my first performance. This one was uh, at Jetwave in my performance, Made Without Tears, that was M-A-I-D. And I was performing right at this moment, my song Made Without Tears, M-A-D-E, and performing with my appliance orchestra. I essentially didn't know what I was doing. So I went to the Goodwill and I got a bunch of appliances and I glued things to them and made this kind of cacophony of, of percussion. And then also added some visual devices like uh, on the, I guess that would be the left as you're observing it. Well, the thing with spiky pictures on it is a tie selector turned on its side with things taped on it. And down in the front is a turntable that I glued mirrored pieces to so that when I shone a light into it, it would reflect light back into the eyes of the audience. Not an original idea, by the way, that came from the Dada is, but I, it wasn't very strong. Um, so the orchestra, uh, oh, here's some details of the uh, visual aids, the roto on the left and the jingle tree on the right, which would, I would pound and hit those bells with that little plastic paddle down on the, the side of it there. Okay. So this photograph uh, was taken by my friend Ann Skinner Jones uh, for my performance, right before my performance at 80 Langton. It was titled, Iowa, Oh Beautiful Land. And that performance delineated a matriarchy set in a homemade uh, Buck Rogers kind of futurism. And I yodeled during that performance. I was the peak of my bravery and sang songs that I had written and showed a lot of imagery that I created that described this place, Iowa, oh beautiful land. At that time, I was writing and performing my music with electronic instruments that I built under the guidance of the great Frankie Mann and also using early digital sound toys like the Casio VL tone. Uh, that was 10 years in the Bay Area and I took my photography and performance art and moved to the Lower East Side of New York City 
lucky to show my photographs at photo gallery in Soho. And, but soon I was melding this kind of photographic performance stuff into installations. And this one was an early one done at City Arts Books, I think it was called. And I called it The City is a Woman and everything was rotating in this uh, installation. I don't have a video of it. Uh, the parts were motorized. Uh, I continued to perform uh, with songs titled uh, switch fever. My greatest hit was Housewives in Space. This poster was produced for Orbit on the Hour, a performance uh, at Franklin Furnace. And at that time, I was very lucky and fortunate to get funded with the National Endowment for the Arts Grant under the category of new genre. So I was official. Uh, I also, towards the end of my stay in New York, I produced a window at the New Museum when it was still on Broadway and under Marsha Tucker. Uh, it was full of moving forms and twittering birds and illuminated forms. I used to, in my performances, buy these toys that were fur covered that would do all manner of things. Like that little guy on the bottom there was a drummer and I'd strip the fur off them and paint them and uh, add photographic elements to them to change them up, to transform them. That's a big theme in my work. And I also continued to make large scale uh, hand colored photographs during that time. Uh, the set idea was always with me. I was uh, working with a view camera and as I said, hand coloring the black and white prints. Uh, there's another one. Oh, this was called Mondo Condo. So you can see I'm still invested in this idea of kind of an interior futurism. What somebody, some slightly demented artist might think futurism was. And this is a, uh, Garden of Paradise. Okay, and this is my last piece I exhibited before I left New York City. Uh, it was in an installation at City Gallery and it was uh, a piece that was actually run by the participant who was looking at it. There was a foot pedal not viewed here uh, that the viewer would push on and put the headphones on and then all the pieces would move around, they were motorized and you would hear my song that I had created on the CMI Fairlight, which was a really amazing synthesizer that allowed me to sample music. You can do the same thing on GarageBand now these days, but at that time it was phenomenal. It was kind of an orchestral piece in a way. And uh, my daughter told me the other day that somebody had uh, posted that song, it's called Marvel's Paradise on YouTube with some bogus image that's not mine, but you can still hear the song. Then I took a hiatus and uh, by that time I was married and I moved to Athens, New York. You might know where Hudson, New York is. It was right across the river. And with an investor, this hotel became my new project with my ex-husband. It was a 150 year old uh, hotel, wooden. It's absolutely beautiful, but it didn't look anything like this in the beginning. Uh, we had to renovate it. It was all sweat equity. Uh, a lot of it was falling down. Um, so for at least 10 years, we worked solid, renovating as we could go. The restaurant was on the first floor, the bed and breakfast on the second. We lived on the third. And uh, during that time, I poured all that creative energy into the project and overwhelmed by the demands of business and my two babies that came along. I just didn't make work for 10 years. Uh, people responded to what we did. They came from all over on weekends. This is before 9-11, so no, hardly anybody lived upstate, but people still came. Uh, we had a great clientele and uh, it was uh, creative and fun and the food was really good because my ex-husband was really quite a chef. So when it was all over, we left, uh, quite poor actually, and uh, didn't make a penny. And I was determined to do whatever it takes to uh, become an artist again. Okay. All right. Uh, so continuing on, uh, see, I was ready when I left the hotel to re-engage my inner life and headed straight back to painting. In these uh, next three files, you can see that I was playing with the substrates picking up my voice. Uh, photography remains present and by that time I had learned all about digital photography 
and how to work with images in Photoshop. Um, this is actually a portrait of my daughter Mabel at that time. And I was very interested in portraiture and investigated it for a while. Uh, John Davis Gallery in Hudson started giving me shows and represented me. Here's a portrait I made of him in 2006 and a self-portrait. At that time, I was patching together a life, teaching sometimes five to nine classes a week, running all over the place, taking my girls to lessons. But I was also in the studio whenever I could sneak time and uh, setting a timer. If I had 20 minutes to make work, I did. Uh, I wanted to paint the figure in motion and developed what I called the walking project. And that started because we got a dog and I had to walk the dog. She needed walking. She's an Australian shepherd. Um, so I made all these paintings of people walking and I got funding to post these paintings, a series uh, uh, in Athens at different little stations. Uh, this one is called Parade Walker. And there I am, I opened the walking project in Athens with a performance. So you can see right behind me, is a painting, it was a reproduction of a painting. And it was a self-guided tour. So outside of the performance, you could walk around Athens and go from one painting to the next. And I essentially told stories that I had gathered. This is one of the things I loved about the hotel is that I was behind the bar a lot and I got to hear stories, both about the history of Athens and what people were doing. And so what I did was I elaborated those stories. And at the beginning of my performance, I announced some of the stories I'm about to tell you may be true. So with the walking project, more abstraction was coming into my work. I was making lots of paintings that were a mapping of my personal life, my inner landscape. I think it was kind of chaotic for me at the time. So it was a way of working things out and also developing my painting. This one is called Island of Calm. Here's another, what I think is a self-portrait. It was called, or this piece is called Alone in a Boat. Um, at that time, I felt like I had to project myself large on the world and project this kind of confidence that I didn't necessarily have, both so my girls felt secure and I could just kind of bumble through life, not always successfully. <laughs> um, my family lived in very different parts of the world and lots of times I felt kind of alone. Uh, I don't say that for self-pity, but that's what this was about. At that time, it was kind of a snapshot of the way I felt. And here's a more joyful painting. This is called, We All Explode Together. It was kind of a visual song I was sending out to the other single mothers of the world who were raising a family, making a living to support my family, making art and holding it all together. And as I said, not always tremendously successfully. Um, here are three more expressions of inner roiling. This one is fuck self doubt, peering through my selfie and broken bird. 2015, things changed for me. I moved to Western Massachusetts and into a new life. My uh, girls were safely launched out of college, pursuing their own destinies and I was able to experience a new kind of focus. There's my dog, Genevieve. Dale, my partner, put up walls in one corner of this building, uh, his big shop, he's very generous to me that way, and I moved into a large studio. Uh, the experience of time and space was profound. Uh, my work shifted to my surroundings. I began to walk this road to my studio every day and was moved by the variations of patterns I was observing on my walks. And I would look out my studio window and see this and saw all the changes in light and color and it really got to me. And so Nature Dress became my next body of work created entirely in blues. Uh, this piece is called Quite the Right Color. Uh, you can see that uh, the relief work came back and uh, there are also photographic elements in this. Uh, another relief work made with painted metal. And this piece is called Plumage Column One. It's 60 by 42. And Sky Lace, uh, part of a series of drawings I did with gouache. 
At the end of Nature Dress, here's my studio. I was ready for color and made this painting. It was really about an encounter with a dead flicker. Kind of a sad story, but the flicker was so amazing to look at. On 2017, I was driving up to the Dream Away Lodge and saw this red patch of light and pulled the car off to the side of the road and took a photograph of it. And that moment cemented my next move, which was a study of light events. I titled this body of work, Light Switch. Sometimes it was based on photographs like this one and sometimes on memory. I spent a year and a half developing these paintings frequently using fluorescent paint in them to imbue a light experience in the work. This one is called Sheer Coruscating Dither. It was based on a memory I had of looking at a uh, light bouncing off the top of a lake. Uh, so I made 12 of these big 60 by 42 inch paintings on paper and mounted them on my studio wall. I'm fortunate to have a 30 foot wall and I've done a bunch of different things with it. I also made some other paintings. Here's a photograph of what it looks like out my kitchen window. Usually in the fall, the fog's coming in and when there's sunrise, it looks like this. And I made this painting called uh, Cold Morning uh, Foggy Glow. <laughs> uh, as I studied more and more about the physics of light, I got interested in ice crystals. And one day I was walking on the snow and I saw the sparkle on the snow and I thought, well, what would it be like to be inside that ice crystal? And I made a painting called Soft Sparkle of a Single Crystal about that moment for scale, there, there they are in the uh, studio. Here's a photograph I happened to capture of a sun dog. Again, sun dogs are created with ice crystals up in the troposphere. Ice platelets have to align for it to happen. The sun has to be kind of low in the sky. And sometimes there's one on each side of the sun. This day there was only one. And I made this painting called uh, Horizontal Drift and Float. So this is still the light switch series. Um, and when, after I closed the light switch show at John Davis 2018, there was a barrage, a big barrage of bad news about global warming and it really got to me. And I made this painting uh, called Fast Earth. It's kind of an image of the earth exploding. I was really depressed that time, at that time about what was going on and decided to try to make work about something that was bad. Um, and I was fortunate at that moment to be able to work at Dudenay at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and work with these incredible master paper makers. And for two days, I made 13 pieces that I had designed to be a wall installation. This is seismic waltz, it's 40 inches high. And here on this slide are some images of what was going on with that wall installation. You can see on my left anyway, I hope it's on your left, <laughs> the color chart I had to send to Dudené so they could pre-mix the color pulp paint. And behind that is a mock-up of what I was gonna be making down there in the center are the pieces that came out of the screens. And on the right are pots of pulp paint that I was able to paint with. It was an amazing experience. And so I mocked up this wall installation. I was getting ready for a show at the courthouse gallery up in Lake George. And here I am on my movable ladder, uh, kind of making the shapes, trying to figure out where things went. Uh, here's the installation in my studio. And it was actually a narrative. And here it is in the Lake George courthouse gallery. And I had a little handout that I gave to people so that they could read the narrative. And it went like this, begin top left with the Gordian knot of humanity, then move down to tepid human response, go up through terrible storms, then go down to the tossing out of birds, enter at center top into the ocean of human angst, then down to the destruction of beneficial species, move right, to the earth churning in its own change. Top right is the imp impassive pace of earth spinning a new existence. And finally trail down right through our helpless adaptation and extinction. So you can see I could, was feeling relatively dark 
about uh, what was going to happen to us. There's a close up of uh, one of the pieces. Uh, Equator Speed was the name of that. Also part of that show were these two sentinels. Uh, I was projecting them as figures that would be perhaps on a wall or guarding a future, uh, maybe archeological installation. On the left is Duchess of Squeeze and on the right is Heavy Metal Eddie. In this apocalyptic vein, I went on to think about what our next life form, intelligent life form might be on earth. And I came up with the idea of uh, intelligent algae. And this is a portrait of Madame du Berry of the Ruffle Rocks. The Ruffle Rocks are a family of intelligent algae. Here's a group of the paintings. Um, top left is Rex Ruffle Rock. Top right is Royd Ruffle Rock Revolutionary. Bottom left, you've seen Madame du Berry and Roxy Ruffle Rock is bottom right. You can see in this series of portraits, I'm repeating a visual motif with the crosshair of the face and this kind of shield in front. With that, I decided to lighten up. And uh, now we're going into work that is very contemporary. Uh, this image was captured at the Vermont Studio Center when I started this work. I was thinking about what might not change with uh, global warming. I thought, well, geology isn't gonna change. Uh, the earth is four and a half billion years old and perhaps what's underneath our feet will stay safe, uh, stable. So this piece is uh, now up in Opelka. It's uh, one of six on a panel of three over three about 16 feet by 16 feet. These paintings are on Tyvek, painted with acrylic with large knives and uh, large brushes, very thin paints. So you can see all that dripping and some pastel work and some photographic work has managed to stay with me. This is Spacewalk. Again, it's the same size on Tyvek, 84 by 60. And this is chill margin. So all of this work that makes up geologic time, that's the name of that big piece, is about uh, the geology of the earth, what's actually going on underneath our feet. It's incredibly active if you read about it. There's magma pushing up as in the case of chill margins. When magma pushes up vertically through the earth, it hits cooler rock and you get these incredible uh, rock formations. This is birth of a heartbeat there. I was teasing out the idea that perhaps some of the, the movement underneath our feet might help with new life forms, but I didn't linger there too long. This is melt gone wrong. There you can see the evidence of my photographic work as well as a lot of linear pastel work. I got really interested in using line in this series and there it is in Opelka. You can go up there tomorrow and see this uh, with a human, my sister Sitara, uh, standing there looking at it for scale. Okay, uh, also part of this work uh, is I started thinking about the geology of where I live. When I walk down the farm road, I look at this mountain. It's called Monument Mar Mountain. Uh, photography does this where you think things look big, they look small when you get the photograph, but it's actually a really big mountain when you get up on the top of it. And I was interested to find out that uh, it's a quartzite mountain and it was formed when the continents kind of slammed together and through a, a fissure, this mountain rose up and it became part of the Berkshires. Um, and I made this painting called Rift. So as I was making this smaller series about where I live, I was thinking more about how the time of the geology was very, very long. And I've been thinking about time a lot. Also out my window, I look, uh, my studio window, I look at this field that I found out was an ocean floor at one point and then the ocean receded and became a very large lake. And that receded and became uh, two rivers that uh, are on the borders of the property where I live, the Williams and the Housatonic. And as a result of all that uh, activity of waters receding and things growing, the earth out there is incredibly fecund in, in its honor, in its uh, honor of its transition. I made this painting called Alluvian Fan. So this idea of time being marked with different kinds of elements other than minutes and hours and seconds 
I started thinking of, well, what if we used a different unit of measure? And I would go out to, into the field and look at our pond at different times of the year at different times of day. And so I made this piece called Pond Clock. It is kind of a, a reference to that of looking down in that pond in that, I'm gonna use a word I love, crepuscular light. It simply means twilight, that it's beautiful light where things start reflecting and bouncing back. So this one's called Pond Clock, it's a relief. And here's another clock, it's, uh, <laughs> I got this idea when I took a really big piece that's in Opelka, it's called Tower, it's eight feet high. I took it outside to dry and it started, a breeze came along and kind of made it topple over and I caught it and I thought, well, breeze, that's a different kind of clock. Like how long is a breeze? So I decided to make breeze clock, that's the title. And I wanted it to feel very ephemeral and light and use line to kind of give me a sense of the momentary aspect of the timing of a breeze. Uh, so here is an image uh, of actually the development of a piece. Uh, these three are the beginning parts. I'm not sure why it's looking like this, but the drawing was on the left. And this piece was about the experience of being uh, in the Williams River in a very shallow part, kind of laying on my belly and looking at these wavelets going past my ear with light bouncing on them. And so I thought, well, I'm gonna make a piece about that. I'm gonna call it wavelet clock. So you can see, went from drawing and then I kind of chopped off the bottom part in the middle to come to the right and painted that big gesture. And then I did some more painting. I put it on the floor. You can see my feet to look at it and I didn't like it and I painted it out. And then I ended up with the finished piece over on the right, breeze clock. Um, this summer, a giant swallowtail was hanging out on my zinnias and I was thinking, well, how about flutter clock? How fast is a flutter? So I made this piece called flutter clock that I, I don't know if I was successful in getting the movement, but I wanted to get that feeling of transparency that happens when things move very, very quickly. Oh, it's gonna flutter. Okay. Uh, sunspot clock was another piece. I'm working on mylar with fabric and painting. There's still photography sneaking in there. Sunspots are a phenomenon that uh, move across the face of the sun. Some of them can last as long as 11 years. And this is moon clock, result of the pandemic. I spent the summer eating out on the porch with friends and family and our dinners would go off into the evening and we we're lucky enough to have a moon. In this case, this memory came from a full moon peeking out from behind dark clouds kind of coming in and disappearing. It's a lot of fabric with a piece of metal behind it there. <laughs> There's my daughter, Hattie. She has always hated being photographed and she's made this face forever. So I photographed her and I'm sharing this to show you the scale of the clocks. Hi, Hattie. <laughs> this one is called Edge Clock. Uh, it is uh, quite large. Um, it's made of canvas and it is a clock in the sense that the dark center I perceive to be humanity kind of clustered around the center, which is a core looking down into some kind of white circle. And it is gravity that unites us as human on this planet, it keeps us all here. And so I think that dark core is humanity looking down into the void. It's made with fabric and photographs and line. I was gonna put it in the Opalka show, but it just wouldn't fit. Uh, here's an image of it in my studio for scale. And those two pieces on the right actually did make it into the show. I'm gonna show them in a second. This is an image from Opelka. And uh, that's my sister Jean peeking around the corner of Tower. And on the right is Cuesto. So I made these, all of this work that I've been showing since I started the Tyvek pieces have been made within the past year, year and a half. And, I was still thinking about a little bit about this idea of encountering archeological elements in the future. I'm not really depicting the future as much as kind of indicating and underneath Cuesto on the right is this kind of warning in a poem. 
you know, it's, they look like hides, those canvas pieces. They feel like it too. And you know, it's kind of hanging there as this little bit of a dark reminder of global warming. And that's in my studio for scale. So you can get a little bit of a feeling about it. Um, and I'm now in Opelka. Thank you, Judy Gilmore, for capturing this picture of me uh, during installation. There I am painting on the wall behind the piece. You can see the design on the right. Uh, I photographed it in my studio and mocked it up so I knew you know, how big to make things and used a lot, a whole lot of tape. And there's the piece, it's called Release of Gravity. And this is where I'm gonna end because this is where my work is now going to develop from, I believe. I've already started gluing up some fabric and mylar pieces in my studio, uh, looking at the future. I wanna continue on with this kind of drawing that you see on this mylar and perhaps combining it with objects. There's a piece of string there that's hanging down from the light blue piece with drawing on the right. Okay, so that's my shoe, folks. And I am going to stop sharing and open it up for questions. Anybody have any questions? Judy, how do we do this? Hear you, Judy. There we go. I was not mute, unmuted. I'm sorry. I was going to say, if you would like to please unmute your microphone, ask a question, feel free to do so. If you're more comfortable um, asking in the chat, you can do that as well. Um, you're, I'm really curious about, you know, it looks like your work is so influenced by just the beautiful nature that surrounds you. Is that a new development for you to just live so closely to the land? I mean, or has this always been kind of something that's really fueled you? That's a great question. Uh, it is new. Well, I can actually date it to 2015 when I moved to this incredible farm I live on with my partner, Dale. You know, he got it 35 years ago. It was falling apart. You know, it's another one of those this old house stories. And he moved in and renovated and I came along. We had a long distance romance for 15 years. And I finally got the bravery to move over to Great Barrington. And it wasn't until I started working in that studio that I really got affected by everything that goes around me. And I don't think that's gonna stop because there's always something to look at here. And I find it tremendously inspiring. That's great, thank you. Any other questions for Yura? Mm -hmm. Yura, I mean, can you talk a little bit about this show and preparing the work for the show and really choosing the work for this show? Um, how, you know, you have a huge body of work and, and you've been really prolific since the pandemic. Um, how did you decide what you wanted to show? Well, uh, I had started some of it before the show was accepted by Opalka. So because my gallery's, uh, my gallery, my studio is big, I was making large work not with the intention of putting in an opelka, but it just worked out that way that the, the big paintings of geologic time just fit there. In fact, we barely knew that they fit there. That was part of the decision was Amy Griffin going up in the lift with the tape measure and measuring that back wall. It was a little bit of a squeaker, but it worked out. So that was one part of the decision was that big piece. Um, I did make a release of gravity specifically for Opalka because I wanted it to look as though, that's that last piece I showed. Uh, I wanted it to look as though that piece was escaping from the paintings, that it was kind of freed in a way from geologic time. And that's the way I felt about the painting when I was developing it because I was experimenting with so many different ideas. I had no idea if it was gonna work out. I didn't finish it really. I don't think I finished it in time to send you guys the, the file. I think I had to send it kind of late, sorry, Amy. Uh, <laughs> but I uh, was working it out, trying all these different things and it did come together with a little help from my friends. I see them out there in the audience. I have a few friends that I send files to that advise me. 
Um, so that was selected. And then Judy, you're the one that selected Cuesto because you felt like it fit in with this whole idea of unraveling because when you say the word unraveling, you immediately think of a spool of thread, you know, as pulling on a spool of thread or a weaving that's kind of slowly coming apart. And Cuesto certainly fits in theme and in feeling with that idea. Uh, so Cuesto was an early choice actually, even before all the rest. And Tower kind of just developed. It looked good next to Cuesto in my studio. So that's that eight foot tall thing <laughs> that I made. You can walk around behind it. I'm hoping you all come up to the gallery and do a in real life visit because even though I'm the one talking tonight, I have been so honored to work with these incredible artists, Ruby Palmer, Christina Tanaglia, and Joan Grubin. And their work is really incredible and you really owe it to yourself to come up and see their work um, and the combination of it all together. So it was the whole formation of the show was a work in progress. There was a lot of going back and forth between us I did some uh, in real life studio visits as I could uh, this summer. Uh, there was a lot of discussion, uh, not so much, you know, what am I gonna show as just kind of bouncing ideas because those three artists are so strong that they felt very secure in what they were showing. And I think it shows in the exhibition itself. That's great, that. thank you, Yara. Um, we have a question about your choice of Tyvek as the material. Can you talk a little bit about why you chose and used Tyvek for your paintings of geological time? Sure. It came right out of that experience of making those big paintings on 300 pound uh, heavy weight paper. Those oil paintings that were in light switch I showed earlier, the ones with the fluorescent paint in them. They were fantastic to work with those big pieces of paper, but uh, I was running into some issues with them. I, storage was one and then John showed the work and at the time he wanted me to frame them and that got really prohibitive. And I thought, well, why don't I make some paintings on something that is pretty strong and I can just roll up and store in a tube. And then I found out that uh, I could buy Tyvek without the insulating label on it and started messing around with it. And it was fantastic for doing what I wanted to do because I could spread the paint with a big, large, like, uh, well, that looks really big on the screen, but maybe seven inch knife. And it just, the way it worked across the, the surface, it was just ideal for those paintings. Cause I wanted the paintings also to feel kind of fragile as though they were reflecting what was going on in our society right now, who we are as human, you know, everything is unsteady and we don't really have a rock solid compass or it felt like we used to have one, but I wanted the Tyvek to float and to really give us this idea that things are temporary and uh, maybe the paintings will be too, I don't know, but I won't be around. And we'll leave that for the conservators to have a job in the future. <laughs> um, Nancy has a question. She says, in looking at your early work, she's thinking about how working in physical space and directly on a wall is something that you're coming full circle again. Um, the Dudon pieces are an example. Um, can you talk about that working directly on the wall and in a physical space? Yeah, well, again, it has to do with scale. Because I have that 30, 30 foot wall to work on, I use it. And uh, when I first did the Dudoné uh, wall installation, I wanted it to interact with the wall. So that's when I made those drop shadows that were in that piece. And I really enjoyed it. Although it was daunting uh, because of the scale of it. Again, it stretched across 25 feet and uh, it set off a whole, influx of ideas uh, for me to be able to work. And it's something I would like to do more of. The idea of flatness interests me. I am a two dimensional artist after all, um, but I like the way things kind of sit on a wall and interact with shapes on the wall. 
So that is something that I expect to do more of in the future. I hope that answers your question to Nancy. Thanks, Nancy. Um, another question from Leslie. Um, talking, can you talk more about release of gravity? She said she went to see the work and it, it's really huge. She really likes them, but what's the reason you decided to make them so large? Well, it needed to talk to geologic time. So in this, uh, the gallery, uh, geologic time is almost 16 feet wide. And I felt if I put a small piece there, it just wouldn't have that kind of conversation. So that was the scale idea. Um, and it, as I mentioned, it was made for Opelka. And I tried it out in my studio, you saw the picture of it, and I did a lot of measuring and eventually I was satisfied that it would be able to work with it. So it was really uh, the scale of the two pieces together on that wall. That's what was important to me. I didn't want to go from something that was so large. If I learned nothing else about working in relief, you need transition for things to feel as though they fit together. In other words, if you have a six foot piece next to a one inch piece, our eyes can't make the leap as easily as you can if you have pieces that are closer in scale. Wonderful, thanks, Sierra. Uh, mm -hmm. Question from Ruby. I'm really interested in this as well. Your uh, performance work was very intriguing to me, Yura. But Ruby asks, so your early work with all the me mechanized elements seems to have influenced your work even now. Questo in particular has the feeling of a prop or having meaning beyond the hanging that's just on the wall. Do you think about this like as your studio as a set and your work as elements in a performance? Oh, that's such a thoughtful question. Thank you, Ruby. Uh, only when I dance, Ruby. <laughs> I listen to music all the time in the studio. Is it a performance? And thank God it's for a performance of one, just me. Uh, but not to you know, make fun of your question. Um, I think it's all a big ball of wax. You know, when I was looking through early work and I'm sure any artist that has been working over a lifetime runs into this, that things change, but they don't really change. That all the stuff that you started with is there. So that expression of whatever it is, who I am as a human always comes out. And with me, the communication sometimes can feel quite strong as though if we could only put a little ear horn to Quaisto, maybe we could actually hear what it is it's trying to tell us. But as an artist, I want it to remain ambiguous because I want the ambiguity to really be part of it. I love language. Uh, I've gotten very interested in titles and talking about my work, but you know, it's a little bit like poetry. We use poetry to express in language what we can't express in everyday life. So poetry takes us somewhere else and that's what I want my work to do. Good, I'm glad you, um, you addressed that because we had another question from Karen who really wanted to ask you about your writing and she wondered if it was like speaking in tongues almost. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, well, if it is speaking in tongues, the tongue is drawing. You know, I really, obviously I'm communicating that it's like language, like at the bottom of Cuesto. And I've done this in other pieces too, where I've used language as a formal element, but also as a communicative element where we feel as though something is being said and perhaps it draws us in a little closer to try to figure out what that is. I don't even know. How can we know as artists? All we can do is try to, uh, I'm gonna use that word channel, but there it is. You know, we're tied into some kind of communication as humans. We're all very intuitive. We feel that when we face each other, when we can these days in the pandemic, we intuit who the other person is. And I think in art, it's very similar that we feel very intuitive about what it is that we're looking at. So not everything can be communicated in sentences that can be read from top to bottom, left to right. Sometimes we just have to leave it 
as a meaning that um, might talk to a different part of us, a different part of our brain. That's great. Um, a more specific question from Grace. Um, how did you approach your Athens Park, Athens Park about your walking installation? She's interested in what that process was like and how you were connected with them. Well, uh, first I got funded. I was Greene County, so I was very lucky. Thank you, Greene County Council of the Arts gave me funding, which allowed me to print out those stations. And then uh, at the same time, I started asking the powers that be. I think I uh, put in a request to the mayor. Uh, I, one of the stations was at the fire station. So I asked the, the fire station chief. Uh, they were posted in front of people's homes. So I knocked on doors and asked if I could post a painting there and if I could bring a group of people around. And the answer was universally yes. So I think it's just, you know, if you wanna do a project like that, just ask. Certainly worked for this exhibition. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, 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 we're so pleased that you, you did curate this exhibition. Um, you're, uh, uh, no more questions from the chat, but I, I sure am curious, what's next for you? What are you working on right now? Well, I just started gluing up some of those uh, fabric on Mylar pieces, and I intend to do a series of drawings that maybe will be more interconnected with you know, drawings with big shapes going from one to another. I don't really know at this point. I uh, have a, a piece coming up I've got to develop. Uh, the curator, uh, Carrie Fader, has asked me to be part of Hermerica, which will be down in Woodstock. So I'm going to, I think I'm going to make a quilt for that. I'm not sure. So that's one thing. Uh, other than that, I will be out there asking. And by the way, I really want to get in here. But I want to thank you, Judy and Amy, for being open to my ask. And also thank you to Opelka and Russell Sage College for having you two at the head of the gallery. Uh, I know I ask a lot and it doesn't always come back with a yes. So <laughs> it really meant a lot to me and I'm very, very uh, appreciative of that. So what's next? Tune in folks, I don't know. <laughs> well, thank you, Yura. I have no doubt that it'll be fabulous. So we all look forward to, to seeing that. So I want to thank you so much for sharing your work. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. And, you know, please encourage everyone to come and see the show. Um, it's up in until December 19th. Um, again, you know, Opalka Gallery, opalka.sage.edu for our times. Um, also, you can view the exhibition and virtual tour there as well. So please, if you aren't on our mailing list, feel free to put your address or email address in the chat and we can capture it there. And we hope you will come by and that we will see you. Um, thank you everyone. If we can give Yura some virtual claps and thumbs up, she'd appreciate it and have a wonderful night, everyone. Thank you, Judy. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for attending. <laughs> Thanks, Yara. Good night, everyone. Good night.